Aftai, thank you so much, Adia. It's been a pleasure getting to know you. I'm just going to do a little housekeeping here. So I promised my son, Oscar, and my wife that I'd do a two-hour lecture here tonight. And about halfway through, do in a nutshell, and then go another hour long. I just love that. So, <laughs> no, in all seriousness, thank you so much, and thank you to uh, Achieve Minneapolis and my good friend Daniel Grant for the opportunity to spend a little time with you guys here tonight. Um, my wife, Michael, uh, for being here tonight. My son, Oscar, daughter, Nora, is not able to make it. She uh, is not feeling well. Actually, I think she might have come down with what uh, Nevada came down with. It's unfortunate that we're not going to get a chance to hear Nevada's story because she's a pretty amazing woman. With her on a number of occasions, and uh, she's really good people. So, so before we get started here tonight, we're going to be here for a little. Um, I was planning to talk for about 15, 20 minutes. I can stretch it a little bit. It would be great though if people feel comfortable asking a question. It's a small group, and I think we can keep it relatively intimate here. I'm trying to navigate this cord here. So before we get started, before I get started, I would like everyone to stand up. If you could stand up for me, and I'm going to put the microphone on the stand here. So I was talking with my brother, Tai Malilangi Steve. Tai Malilangi is his title. And uh, I was asking him about the meaning of the word chihu. And he said, chihu is a very special word in Samoa and in Samoan. It's a word that describes a feeling of joy, a feeling of laughter. It's a word to describe uh, your expression of uh, gratitude for an accomplishment that someone that you care about has made. So I figured what we'd do tonight is I would teach you how to chihu. How many people want to learn how to chihu? Okay, all right. Those of you that don't, you're going you're gonna to miss out. All right, so here's what you need to do. Um, you need to stand kind of like the way you would stand when you're trying to start your lawnmower. All right, so your, your left foot should be forward and your right foot should be back kind of in an open stance. You can kind of move back and forth a little bit, just sway a little bit. Okay. Now, in Samoa, chihu is usually done like this. But I like to add a little Midwestern Twin Cities twist to it. So what I like to do is I like to kind of go like this, up in the air. So I'm going to do a demonstration. I'm going to model, and then I'm going to ask you all to do the same thing. Okay, and I'm going to count down. Uh, three, two, one, and then you're going to do your chihu, okay? Now, I've been told this is the A group. So my expectations are, are very high. All right, here we go. Got to get myself ready. Chihu! All right, let's see what you guys got. Three, two, one. That was very good. Give yourselves a round of applause. Excellent. That's, that was very good. All right. Well, I just thought that would be a nice way to kind of get things started. Get myself situated here. So my name is Leotawa Dr. John Peterson. Most people here call me John. Um... I am originally from Western Samoa. I was born in the capital city of Apia. And I was born at a hospital called Motoatua. And it's high up on the ridge, uh, just a little bit north of downtown. Um, put this down a little bit. My dad was first, no, second generation Peace Corps. Uh, a fun story. I asked my dad one time, so dad, why did you choose to go to Samoa? And he said he always had been fascinated by Oceana. Uh, back in the 1950s, uh, you could take UPC uh, from the back of um, cereal boxes. And you could turn them in and you could get an encyclopedia, um, a set. And so the last book in the set was a book of Oceana. 
And as he flipped through those pages as a youngster of 12, 13 years old, he became just fascinated by the South Pacific region. And so that was one of the main reasons he decided to go to Samoa. And he didn't make it to Colombia. I think he wanted to go there first, actually. So if you recall back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, Vietnam, and my dad was uh, a teacher. So he, he did not have to go to Vietnam. His draft card number was pretty high. But at the time, he felt an obligation to serve his country. And so he entered into the Peace Corps. He was in the Peace Corps for about three and a half, four years, basically from 1972, fall, to the spring of 76. Uh, while he was in Samoa, he met my mom, and my mom's name is Salamasina Stevenson. Um, they met, and they ended up getting married, and they had me. I am the only child from that marriage and relationship um, but I have 18 siblings. So, as you can imagine, it's a relatively diverse and mixed group uh, when we get together. We have a lot of fun. Um, and I just want to send a shout out of love to all the folks in Samoa and in the Pacific region, as well as the folks in the Midwest. I came to the United States when I was a year and a half old. Um, at the time, I don't think it was probably the norm for a child to stay with the father. Um, and in some respects, I probably very well could have been left in Samoa. And as the story goes, my dad called his mom, my grandmother, Grandma Peterson, and she basically said, you need to bring my grandson back with you. Otherwise, we don't want you back here at the house. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, that's really probably the, 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 the thing that tipped the scale for me coming to the States. Um, so my dad, when I was about three, remarried, and uh, he married my mom, Mary. And I have two moms, Sala and Mary. And um, I have a younger brother, David, and a younger sister, Anna, from that marriage. And... Uh, Grew up in the Midwest. I mean, grew up in Wisconsin. Uh, went to school in Menominee, Wisconsin, and played basketball and football, and um, you know, had a really a very, very blessed life growing up where I did. Um, I was, however, the only person of color, indigenous, in my family, and certainly the only Samoan in Menominee, Wisconsin, and typically the only Samoan in most of the spaces that I find myself in. Uh, professionally and personally. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. I ended up uh, going to River Falls. I played a little basketball there. Adi and I were talking about theater. I did a few years of theater, which was a lot of fun. Um, and then after I graduated in 1999, I came to the Twin Cities to be a teacher. So I ended up becoming a middle-level teacher, seventh and eighth grade, social studies, Spanish, and a little bit of Fayette on a variance. I taught for eight years, uh, about eight years, seven, eight years, and um, just had a wonderful time working with middle-level students. Any middle-level people in here? Any secondary people in here? Okay, there we go. You're my people. I love being with secondary folks. I like elementary folks, too, but my sweet spot is definitely working with adolescents and uh, really had a blessed time working with students that I did over the years. Um, in 2004, I met my beautiful wife, Michael, on a blind date. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in learning kind of the back history to that date, you can always ask her or you can ask me later after we're finished here tonight. Um, we, that year was a challenging year for me. And in, in, in some ways, things came to a head. You know, growing up Samoan in the Midwest, I really didn't express my indigenous identity as much as I probably should have and could have. Um, for all practical purposes, I grew up white. Um, the word in Samoan for white is palangi. Pa meaning break and langi meaning sky or heaven. So literally the story of where white people came from in Samoa is that they came from a break in the sky. 
Um, but I always knew inside that I was Samoan, right? And so part of what I expressed as an educator was my Samoanness, even though I didn't typically show up as a Samoan as a professional teacher. My wife and I married in 2005, and um, shortly thereafter, I ended up going to graduate school. I went to the University of St. Thomas and did a master's degree in public policy. And um, yeah, was just out of the classroom for a little while and just enjoying being a graduate student. I can remember taking the metro from South Minneapolis to downtown Minneapolis and walking the five city blocks from the downtown stop over to the St. Thomas campus. Fond memories of those times. Um, I was struggling, though, at that time. Um, struggling with finding myself and knowing who I was. And I suspect there are more people out there in the world who struggle with finding themselves and who they are um, than, than I would even suspect. Um, I think it's relatively safe to say that indigenous peoples here um, struggle with that, uh, especially young people who are in the foster care system. Um, there are so many different push-pull factors that um, have an influence on who we are and how we show up. Um, and at that time, I really had a strong, strong need to go back to Samoa. So with the support and love of my wife, Michael, um, my mom, Mary, uh, my grandmothers, my mother-in-law, Marsha, um, really the women in my life, I went back to Samoa in 2007. Um, I'd never had any contact with anyone from Samoa. I'd never talked with my mom, didn't know what she looked like, didn't really know anything other than um, some uh, conversations that I'd had with my sister Kiloli back in the mid-1990s. And a big shout out to my sister Kiloli, she lives out in California. I can remember the day that I went back to Samoa. I was with my brother, we were in our place just uh, about a half block to the south of South High School, and uh, he had given me a poem from Garcia Lorca. Those who know Lorca's work from, from, he was from Malaga, from Spain, and he was a casualty of the Guerra Civil, the civil war um, between the, uh, the folks that were supportive of the, the royal uh, crown and the folks that supported the dictatorship. So he was, he was killed during that Guerra Civil, but my brother gave me a poem. And that poem, I don't remember the title of it, but I can recall that it was a poem about hope. And really, in many ways, my story is a story about hope. Uh, maintaining hope in the face of personal struggles, um, personal and professional struggles. Um, so I left the house and no sooner did I leave the house and it started at just pouring rain. Like it was a downpour. I mean, as we say in Wisconsin, it was raining a frog strangler, as they say, uh, back, in, back in Wisconsin. And um, I was soaked. I got on the metro and I got on the plane. And, and uh, I have to be honest with you, I was scared. Very frightened, very scared, not really sure of what I wanted to do, why I was doing it, if I wanted to meet my mom in Samoa, if I thought that they would accept me. Um, so I got on the plane and I flew back to Samoa. Well, I got to Samoa and the first thing I remember is how humid it was. It was like the, the air was just thick with water. It was just like instantly sweating. That was one of the first things that I remembered. I can remember taking the taxi from Faleolo Airport uh, into downtown Apia and looking at the palm trees stretching out over the Pacific Ocean and the beach and the fires burning in the early morning, people getting ready to start their days. Um, and I remember feeling just a, a, a warm sense of, man, this is where I'm from. This is who I am. It was pretty exciting, although I was still a little bit afraid, a little fearful too. So when I got to my hostel, uh, the first thing I did is I told people, well, I'm from, I'm, I'm from the United States, but I'm originally from here. And of course, they're like, no, you can't be from here. You don't look anything like a Samoan, right? It's like, no, I am Samoan. And the, and the ladies working at the front desk of the hostel would just kind of giggle and laugh at me. Um, so I remember having my first meal at the hospital, or not the hospital, but at the hostel um, that was Samoan. It was cocoa and rice. 
uh, and thinking to myself, wow, this is what Samoans eat, right? Never having met really any Samoans my whole life. So without going into too much detail of the journey, I ended up reconnecting with my mom. Uh, she was in American Samoa, not in Western Samoa, which is where I'm from. And uh, it was a pretty epic couple of days to find her and to find my family in Samoa. I walked from uh, the downtown area to a couple different villages, and it was amazing to see strangers come and help me out of nowhere, connect with people who knew my mom. Um, and I can remember when I got into American Samoa at the airport in Pango Pango, I was the last person off of the plane. And I can remember stepping onto the tarmac and seeing in the distance my sister Sayunga. And uh, without even having met her or known what she looked like, I knew instantly that that was my sister. It was a pretty incredible feeling to have that connection and not even know who she was. Uh, we got into the, the, the truck and uh, we drove from the airport in Tafuna to the place in Ili Ili, which is very, about 15 minutes from the airport. And um, as we're driving, Seung says, we're a pretty good sized family. And I said, well, how, how big is it? She said, well, there's, there's 16 of us. And I said, wow, okay. So then she starts going down the list of names. All right now, you're, there'll be a quiz at the end of this. So make sure you remember all these names. So there's Mua, Junior. There's John, there's Moy, there's Lena, there's Lene, there's my sister Nicole, there's me, there's Kiloli, there's Joe, there's Sunny, otherwise known as Tavita, there's Seunga, there's Steve, there's Mark, and there's Ernest. And then I also have two adopted siblings, Imelda and Sala, and then my younger brother David and my younger sister, Anna. So that's my sibling group. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing. So as, as we're driving in the truck, I'm thinking to myself, how am I gonna remember everyone's names? Like, this is impossible. You know, I, I can't remember everyone's, everyone's names, let alone, let alone um, you know, know kind of what I'm doing here, you know? Because I did have a fear that I would get rejected. And I think that's pretty normal for some kids who come from mixed families and mixed homes. So, um, feeling that kind of anxiety and tension and nervousness, and I kind of describe it as a bit of a hole as an educator, both from a professional and personal perspective, um, not knowing your birth mom or not knowing your birth parent or having that connection to your birth family. Um, I can remember getting out of the truck, and right before I got out, Sayunga looked at me and she said, are you ready to meet mom? And I was like, I think so. I think so. So we get out of the truck, and there's my mom. And you have to remember, I've been blessed with two moms. So for my mom, Mary, to give me to Samoa after the years that she took care of me, I just have nothing but um, respect and care and love for what she did. So I remember my mom, Sala, coming to me and putting her arms around me and giving me a huge hug and saying, I love you. I love you, John. And I told her I loved her, too. And at that moment, that kind of hole that I'd experienced for probably most of my life really kind of started to close. And I started to get a firmer sense of who I was. Um, I can tell you that I am far from perfect. I make mistakes every day. But reconnecting with my indigenous roots, which is really what we're here to talk about, reconnecting with my ancestry, uh, reconnecting with just the geography of where I was born and where I'm from has made me a better husband. It's made me a better dad. It's made me a better brother and uncle and son. And it's also made me a better educator. And I think for our students that are in the educational system who come from broken families or mixed family backgrounds, it is so incredibly important for us as educators to meet them where they're at, to meet them at the level of care, love, and kindness. Because ultimately, that's what students are looking for. 
They're looking for a safe place to show up authentically as themselves. And I think that indigenous leaders and indigenous models of leadership offer alternative ways to access and provide access to students to get a great high quality education. So that's in a, in a, in a nutshell, my story. Um, and uh, I guess what I would like to share a little bit now is, uh, you know, I've done some writing um, and I do have a, a book that I've written called Uncovering Indigenous Models of Leadership. Uh, it's an ethnographic case study. So if you like stories, it's a story about a culture sharing group. Um, it is about the leaders from my family. Um, I, I don't say this in a brag way or anything like that. My mom's ancestry is from the royal family of Samoa, and that's called the Sa Maliatoa. Sa means sacred in Samoan, and Maliatoa means great warrior. So my mom's mom, my grandmother, and my great grandmother, and and their great, their, my great great grandmother, trace back to the uh, the royal family of Samoa. And so part of what leadership means to me as an indigenous person is that I have to show up authentically as a Samoan, even in places like Minnesota and Wisconsin, right? It's not a choice. The birthright of the title, Leatawa, which means powerful or important fish, the figurative meaning, he who brings war, is something that I am obligated morally to show up as, right? And so part of understanding indigenous culture as an educator, whether it's a colleague or whether it's a friend, is understanding that there are certain things that I don't choose. I don't choose my birthright, it chose me. Um, I do have agency to make the best of what I have through the mana, which is the blessing, and to give that blessing, or manwia, um, to those that I am with. Um, and I'm obligated to show up how I show up. Um, and I think that's important because I think in some ways people have the choice to show up how they want to show up. So if I want to show up as an anti-racist in terms of my thinking, my actions, my words, I can choose to do that or not choose to do that, right? And part of the way that I'm able to choose that is because of the lighter color of my skin. Right? I have a certain element of privilege because I'm a lighter skinned brother. My brother Mark, for example, is, is far more dark skinned than I am. He doesn't have the same level of choice in terms of how he shows up because of the color of his skin. So what I want to impart upon the audience tonight, one thing from my story is that choose equity. Choose to meet our youth and our students at the level of what they bring as assets to the classroom and also what they bring to the classroom in terms of their needs. It's not just about meeting their needs, it's also about them meeting your needs, right? Because they have things that they can bring to the classroom that are creative, that are innovative, that are unique, that are healing, right? That can help to repair harm. Um, so those would be a couple of pieces that I just want to share about that model of indigenous leadership. Really, it breaks off into two different kind of nested rings. On the one side, you have what are called themes, at least in terms of what I found in the research that I did. Uh, geography matters. So how we show up as leaders in education is dependent in many ways on the geographical context. I kind of call it like the, the, the backdrop that we paint our narratives and stories upon. Secondly, from an indigenous model of leadership, ancestry matters. Knowing your bloodline, knowing where you come from and the tribe that you are connected to is incredibly important. And in that regard, I would say that's important for every single person in this room because we all come from a place. We all come from a group. Right? We all come from a place called home. Right? So knowing that ancestry and knowing those roots is incredibly powerful for educators and to help 
students find themselves to. Um, third, cultural practices matter. So there is a way to do Samoan culture. It's called the Fa'a Samoa, right? And it's loosely translated as the Samoan way, both of being, an ontology, and doing and knowing an epistemology. So when you come to Samoa, you see the Fa'a Samoa expressed in terms of how we prepare the earthen oven called the umu, or how we worship at service, or the meal that follows called to'ona'i, right? That's something that you see in terms of the cultural practices. Um, from an educational perspective, um, formal learning is done in the family, the ayenga, which is the fourth area, and informal learning is done in schools. A little different than the way we think about it here in the United States. We would think that informal's family may be informal school. It's just the reverse. So how you show up as a Samoan is dependent upon your family, dependent upon your ayenga, um, and the obligations that you have to your parents, uh, the obligations you have to the elders in your clan, and the obligations you have to your village. The fifth element I just loosely called identity, or fifth theme I called identity, Leadership identity is the result of those four different aspects or themes. Geography, ancestry, cultural practices, and family. On the other side of the equation, you have what are called the elements. These are the things that you don't readily see when you go to Samoa. The themes you'll see, you'll see that. You'll feel the, the air. You'll see the, the, the coconut. Um, you'll see the cultural practices. You'll engage with family. You'll hear people interact with each other by connecting through the bloodline, right? Oh, you are the grandson of Fonofili, who is the daughter of Seunga from Manono, the Taupo, right? But on the element side, the building blocks, these are the things that you don't typically see as a visitor. Um, one of them is... Uh, service. So servant leadership is incredibly important from a Samoan perspective. Uh, service to family, well, service first to God, Atua. Service to family, service to clan, service to village, district, and then if you're at that level, service to country. So servant leadership really shows up strongly in Samoa. Um, another aspect is belief and belief in God. So um, Samoa, since 1830, has been a Christian nation. 99.9% .9 of all the people in Samoa are Christian. Um, you'd be hard-pressed to go back to Samoa, at least in my family, and not see a very, very strong foundation built upon God and faith in God. Um, so there's that piece. Third, humility, being humble. Showing up humble. So when you come into the Fale, you show up in the culture with an element of humility, right? Um, there are traditions and customs and ways of doing things that have been a part of Samoan culture for thousands of years. And so humbling yourself to the culture was something that took me a while to figure out. Because I was like, no, it's got to be this way. No, you should do it that way. Um, and I, I can remember making many mistakes in my family context in Samoa and also here um, in, the, in the States, in the mainland. Um, but that, that, that humility piece is really important. Another element is uh, um, alofa, right, which is love. Um, I would say it is both an element and a force because everything in Samoa radiates around this notion of alofa, alofa meaning love. And so the work that I've done over the past, I don't know, 10 years or so, has really been rooted in this idea that love is in motion in education. Love is a movement. It's something, it's a dynamic thing that we feel, that we express, that we share. It's the gift that we give to our students, to our colleagues, to our families that we're here to serve. And so... Loosely, the project that I developed was called the Alofa Movement. And, it, and it, I'd be remiss if I said that there weren't dozens of people that had a hand in helping to create and inform this movement. 
All right, and so the last thing I want to leave you folks with before we maybe take a little bit of a break, I think we're probably at 20, 25 minutes here, um, is that if you feel hate, give love, and you will hate no more. If you feel despair, give hope, and you will despair no more. And if you feel fear, give of your faith, and you will fear no more. That really at the core is what the Alofa movement is about. Faftailea Thank you. Much respect. Peace out. And one love.